Is my screen visible? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to talk about uh, an introduction to artificial intelligence and neural networks. Uh, so you've probably heard the term artificial intelligence thrown around a lot, uh, but what exactly does it mean? Well, it's more or less a uh, it's a catch-all term for any kind of intelligence shown by machines or computers. It's not a really specific term. It's just a, anytime you think about artificial intelligence, robots, computers thinking, that's all fall, falls under AI. And within AI is more specific type of, of uh, intelligence called machine learning. And machine learning is uh, algorithms that can learn from experience. So you give them some data, they, they, they go through it, they come up with some result, and then they get some feedback and change how they, how they process the data the next time. And within machine learning is another type called deep learning. Uh, deep learning is modeled after the way our, our brain's neural networks work. Uh, it's called deep learning because it uses multiple layers of so-called neurons or nodes, basically multiple layers of calculations that the data goes through before uh, coming out the other end as output. And it can be multiple layers deep. Uh, so that gives it the name deep learning. And in the category of machine learning, there's a couple of types of learning that you'll hear uh, talked about commonly as you learn more and more about AI. Uh, one of them is called supervised learning. Uh, this is where uh, we uh, humans are supervising how the, the algorithm learns. And in this case, uh, we have, <clears throat> we give it data that's already labeled. We know what everything is in the data. And we use that to, to tell it whether it gets the answer right or wrong. And this is very useful for classification problems. If you need to distinguish between whether this is A, B, or C, uh, then supervised learning is quite useful for that. Another kind is called unsupervised learning. And this is when the data is unlabeled. And we don't, we don't know what our data is, really. Uh, that's for the, uh, the algorithm to figure out. And this is useful for when you have complex data sets, a lot of different factors involved, and you need to find, figure out, is there some kind of pattern in there somewhere? Because we don't know, and we can't supervise that for the, the, the algorithm. We're relying on it to figure that out for us. Um, one example would be if you're trying to figure out, okay, what are the, if you're looking at all 30 different risk factors, different lifestyle factors that somebody has, whether they smoke or drink or whether they were, uh, how tall they were when they were five years old, any kind of factors. If you want to figure out, is there some kind of pattern in all of those that will tell you whether they'll get this disease or that disease when they're, they're 80, then unsupervised learning would, would be what you'd go for there. Third type you'll hear a lot is reinforcement learning. This is where you have a known input, a known starting point, and a known end point. And the goal is to train the algorithm to figure out how to get from the start to the end most accurately in the most efficient way possible. <clears throat> and you can give it mathematical rewards and punishments for how close it gets to the, the end point, how quickly it gets there, and a variety of other things. So supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. You'll, you'll hear those a lot going through as you learn more and more about AI. Now back to deep learning. This is a common sort of representation, graphical representation of, well, this one's not very deep, but a simplified version of what a deep neural network might look like. You have some inputs, a bunch of different nodes, sometimes called neurons. These all connect up with all the others. And you put some input data 
it gets passed on and calculated and passed on, calculated, passed on, calculated till we finally get to an output. That'll be your prediction for whatever you've, you've designed your neural network to do. And as I said before, these are these are often used with unsupervised learning when you're, when you're trying to figure out complex patterns from multiple factors. And it can be very uh, power hungry and data hungry. You need a lot of data to get these to work well. And just from the sheer number of calculations that they have to do, it can take quite a lot of computing power. And you've probably interacted with uh, deep learning neural networks today or yesterday. If you have a smartphone every day, there are neural networks constantly harvesting and processing your data, trying to figure out what, what's the best ad I should send you, what's the, what's the next best Netflix show I should recommend to you. So these are so a lot of these going on behind the scenes of most of your favorite apps and websites. And in medicine, one of the earliest successful applications of, of this was called the ChexNet or chest x-ray network. So this was a 121 layer neural network. They, they get big fast. Uh, this was trained on a huge number of x-ray images. And now once it's been trained, you can input a, an x-ray image and it'll give you an output like this. It's an overlay with and a, a confidence rating. So this is saying that, okay, based on all of the images I've seen before, this image, I'm pretty sure in this red area, about 85% sure there's pneumonia in this red area. And that's, it was shown to be as good as radiologists can be at detecting pneumonia, but quite a lot faster. But as I said, you need a whole lot of data and a whole a lot, a ton of x-rays to train these, uh, these algorithms. Oh, hello data. Didn't see you there. No, probably shouldn't be smoking. You might get pneumonia or something. Anyway, sorry about that. Uh, AI can be complicated, so we're going to start with a simple example. So you've probably heard of linear regression before. Uh, surely you've heard of a line, and you might recognize this equation down in the corner here as the equation of a line. Uh, linear regression can kind of be thought of as a simple form of machine learning, kind of maybe, but more or less, uh, it's a, a good introduction to some of the concepts that are used in machine learning. And it can be useful to predict different outcomes. So going back to the line of the equation here, in case you've decided to forget your high school days, uh, we have our x, which is our input value or variable. m is the slope of the line. And then b is the, the y-intercept, where the line will intersect on the y-axis. And then all those together will give you a y value. That's your output. And if I translate those into more machine learning type of terms, the x would be the input, also known as features or parameters. You can have more than one. y is your output. And m, the slope, we would call the weight. So if you have a, a big weight on your input feature, then it'll be have more effect on your output. If you have a small weight, it'll have a smaller effect on your output. And then the, the, y, the y intercept, the b here, we would call the, the bias, which is more or less a, a correction factor. And if we rewrite that equation in a using more machine learning terms, down here, this is the exact same equation, just written a little bit differently. X is the same. We've changed the, the M to a W for weight. And we've changed our B for a bias for uh, weight zero. So that'll be our bias. And let's say you want to use a linear regression to figure out, okay, what's someone's risk of heart disease? You might put in three different features, for example, smoking or cholesterol or hypertension, high blood pressure. So you put those in. <clears throat> you, each one of those features would have a, a certain weight associated with it. And then the whole thing would have a, a bias 
And you can rewrite that like this. Just keep adding on uh, parameters. <clears throat> and you can have three, four, a hundred, a thousand, some will have millions. And it can get quite complex. But we're going to stay simple. Okay, so now we have this line. Uh, we need to know like how does it how do we tell whether it, it's a good fit for our data? You can evaluate this with something called loss, which is a measure of a, a model's accuracy. Uh, the goal is to have our loss equal to zero. And in this case, we'll use a, a loss function called mean squared error. And here we just want to calculate what the difference is between our point and our line and kind of come up with a value that includes like, how big a difference we have between all our points of, of data and our, our line. <clears throat> and down here have a, an equation for that. L is the loss, that's our, our goal. We want this to be as small as possible. And this is equal to the sum of the squared error. So this, the error will be, when we're trying to evaluate this, we have set of data points that we know, we know all everything about them. Let's say we have, we want to know somebody's uh, risk for high blood pressure based on number of uh, cigarettes they smoke. So let's say if they smoke five, then they have a 10% risk. And we know that number. so. Our actual value will be 10 if we put in 5 into our line and we come up with, maybe it, it outputs a 7. That'll, then our error will be 2. And then we square that and we do that for every data point, sum them all together, divide it by the number of data points we, we've looked at, and that'll give us our mean squared error, which will be our loss. And just uh, as a calculation here, okay, let's say risk of heart disease. We, let's say we have three patients. These are their actual risks. <clears throat> we put in some factors that will predict the risk. And our, our line model gives us these values. Subtract them to get the errors, square the errors, add up the errors, and divide them by our total number of patients. And that gives us our loss. So now we can kind of get a, a sense of how good our line fits. But now what? Now what? What do we do with that information? Oh, it's Wally. Huh, what's he doing here? Kind of looks lost. Hmm. Huh. Oh, well. Anyway, so as I was saying before, uh, linear regression can be thought of like a, a simple neural network. And so we, we we figured out a way to evaluate how well it, it's performing. But how do we make it learn? How does it learn from from this data? Well, we can represent it in this this form here, where we have our inputs and one output. There's no, there are no layers in between, so it's not really a, a neural network at this point. But it's it's a good way to introduce the concepts. And again, we have our similar equation down here. Again, it's just like a line. We have our weight, which is like the slope, and then our x should be the uh, x point. And we have our, our output for y. So now we need to figure out how can we use our loss value to adjust our weights so that we can get a better, a better loss. Maybe I'll wait here. Do we have any questions so far? Uh, yes. So there are some questions in the chat from uh, previous slides. So one question is, what's an example of reinforcement learning? And another is, how long would it usually take for a deep learning machine to make an accurate output? OK, so an example of reinforcement learning. Uh, let's say you're trying to. I'm not sure what a good medical example would be, but one example, let's say we have a self-driving car and we need it to get from point A to point B and there's some obstacles in the way. 
then we can give it a penalty for hitting an obstacle and give it a penalty for speeding and give it a reward for going the speed limit and give it a reward for avoiding uh, obstacles with a, a certain margin. And then <clears throat> it'll, it basically just goes through trial and error and learning each time based on the rewards and punishments we give it until it eventually finds a uh, most efficient route from point A to point B with with our, our confines that we've given them, with our punishments and rewards. And the other question was, how long does it take? Well, that depends on how complicated your neural network is, how many parameters you have, how much computing power you have. A simple, something small and simple, you can uh, train in a couple of minutes or, or a couple of seconds when you're, using more complicated, intricate things, it can take days and days of continuous processing. And, but there's a lot of, a lot of factors involved of how long it takes. Primarily number of calculations you need to make and how much computing power you have. Okay. Uh, any other questions or shall I continue? There's nothing else. Okay. So well, actually, wait, um, someone says, is there an equivalent square root version of loss or maybe analogous to how standard deviation equals the square root version of variance? I don't know. Maybe Sarah, do you know the answer to that one? Um, basically, the loss function is just there to uh, measure how well your model is doing. So, I mean, presumably, uh, any function that meet a couple of uh, restraints could be a loss function. So, it's just uh, kind of experimentally determined how well it performs. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, I'll I'll move on, and we can answer more questions in a bit. So we've got our, our loss. We have a measure of how well our, our uh, linear regression is doing. And now we need to teach it something, use that information to teach it something. And to do that, we can use something called gradient descent. And it's a method of updating our weights to minimize our loss. And so it'll be a couple of steps here. Usually we start by randomly random initialization where we randomly choose some starting weights and then we calculate our loss and see what we get just a random starting point and then we'll output a loss and then you can use that loss and multiply it by the learning rate so i'll talk about learning rate in a bit but it's basically a step size how big of a change you're going to make to the weights based on on the loss that you have. And then you use that value to back propagate, which basically means update the weights that you have. Uh, down here is an equation for back propagation, which I'll explain in a bit. And this graph here is showing just a simple version of a, like a, a loss graph. So the slope uh, of the graph at any point is equal to the loss for the values at that point. And the goal is to get the slope as close to zero as possible. So that would be down here at the bottom would be a straight horizontal line, which would have our lowest slope. So the goal is to find values of our weights that'll get us all the way down to this minimum loss point. And we figure that out with back propagation. So this equation, should have warned you there is a little bit of math, but it's not too bad. So the W is stands for weights, and this is all the weights that are we're using. If we have one input parameter, we'll have one weight. If we have 100, we'll have 100 weights. And this colon equals sign, this, is, this means to assign. So we're not saying W is equal to this. We're saying we're changing W to this. We're assigning all of these values to W. Uh, 
And then alpha here is our learning rate, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. It's basically just a, a, a number. And then we have our loss, a loss gradient. And uh, this is just the loss for each, fe each feature. There's a separate loss that's calculated for each individual pr parameter uh, <clears throat> or each individual feature. And those are used to update each of the associated weights. And so basically it's saying we take our weight, our current weights, we add our loss times the learning rate, and then we change the weights to this new value. And you can see that as the learning, our loss gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this, this uh, term here gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and we change our weights less and less and less. So the, the less accurate we are, the bigger changes we, we make, and the more accurate we are, the smaller changes we make. I hope that makes sense. So gradient descent is not always as simple as that. At least I hope it was simple, if I explained it well enough. But you don't always have just a nice parabola in your, your loss graph. Sometimes you can have these local minima, and you can get stuck there. You're, your machine learning algorithm can get stuck there. It'll think it's at its lowest loss point. But really, over here, there's another law, a, a much more accurate uh, set of weights that you can use. But it'll get stuck here. And it typically uses more than one dimension, more than two dimensions. You end up with these lost, multi-dimensional lost landscapes. And it can get quite complicated. You can have up to 100 dimensions. But uh, I won't talk about those today. So kept promising I'll talk about learning rate. Here is learning rate. So alpha is just any value, usually between 0 and 1. And it can be more than 1 as well. But if you're, you choose a, you can just choose this arbitrarily. If you choose one that's too small, you can end up taking way too many steps to finally get to your optimum loss. And if it's too big, it can be so big that it'll just skip over the your minimum entirely and never reach there. It'll just bounce around forever. So you can you want to choose something that's somewhere in between. Or there is another solution. You get something called learning rate decay. For this, you can use a variety of decay functions. I'm not going to talk about these in detail, but these are just some common uh, names you'll see when talking about uh, loss decay. But these are functions that uh, use the loss, uh, take the loss into account, and decrease the step size accordingly as your loss gets uh, smaller and smaller. So you'll start out taking big, huge steps. And as the loss gets, slow, gets lower, your accuracy increases then step size gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you save time by jumping right up to your minimum, and then you start fine tuning to find your, your lowest possible loss. <clears throat> so it saves, saves you a lot of time. Huh. I don't know where these guys keep coming from, but they gotta stop interrupting. I don't know if I have an infestation or something. Anyway, <sighs> okay, we talked about how to evaluate your lines, your neural, it's very simple, linear regression as a neural network, and with our loss, and then we can use loss to backpropagate to evaluate our, our weight, or change our weights, but now what are we actually getting out we, put, we put, give it our data. What are we actually getting out, out the other end? There's a couple of types of output data. There's categorical and numerical. Uh, categorical is basically, is it this, is it that, or is it something else? And uh, there's binary uh, output, which is, is it 0 or 1, yes or no? If you give it an x-ray, is there a fracture, or is there no fracture? Nominal is when you have more than one category, and there's no real 
relationship between them. You're just figuring out, is it, is it this, that, or is it A, B, or C? Is this lump a tumor, a cyst, or an abscess? And then ordinal is when you have different categories, but there's an order to the categories. So if you're trying to figure out, is this, are these heart disease symptoms mild, moderate, or severe? Then numerical data can be discrete or continuous. Discrete would be just counting things. If you have uh, this kind of disease, how many comorbidities are you likely to have 10 years from now? Or it can be continuous if you're trying to figure out uh, what, what's the serum potassium concentration going to be if, if I give these five medications for this disease. Uh, so continuous is more when you want to really quantify something more precisely. So you have a bunch of different outputs, but how does the how does your network come up with these outputs? How do you get from input to output? What what's happening with this with your data as you pass it through all these nodes and or neurons? Like how does it decide what to do with it and pass on to the next one? So to do that, a lot of times they will be given something called an activation function. And basically, what does it take to activate that neuron, get it to send off, send its data to the next one? And there's a, a few that you'll, you'll hear about. Uh, the, this one is, first one here is called sigmoid. Uh, there's a little graph of what it looks like there. Basically, it takes the input value and converts it to a value between zero and one. And then another one called tan h, this is a hyperbolic tangent, one of the lesser known uh, trigonometric functions. And you could give it some input data and it'll output a number between minus one and plus one. And sigmoid and tan h kind of do similar things. Uh, I think tan h is a little more modern, more preferred, gives a, it's a little more precise than sigmoid. But th these two are, are good for when you have binary decisions to make. Is it going to be zero or one? Is it going to be plus one or, or minus one? And then the third one here is RELU, RELU. Different people say it different ways, I'm sure. That stands for rectified linear unit. And this one takes an input value checks if it's positive or negative. And if it's negative, it'll output zero. If it's positive, it'll pass on the same input value that it got. And this one is quite useful because the calculation is very minimal and it'll save a lot of computing power. Uh, one more I wanted to mention, another activation function called softmax. And this one takes the input and converts it to a probability distribution. Uh, so this is useful when you have different uh, categorical data and you need to figure out, okay, is it this, is it category A or category B or category C? You can use the incoming data to calculate a probability. Is it most likely to be this one? Is it most likely to be that one? And it can pass that one on. Huh. Hello, Baymax. I, I was talking about softmax, not Baymax. Please stop interrupting. This is getting ridiculous. Okay. I was talking, what was I talking about? I was talking about activation functions. And we talked about a one loss function before. So activation functions some common uses of them. ReLU is really good for all those hidden deep layers in those deep learning neural nets because it's so uh, computationally cheap. There's not a lot of calculation going on. So it'll save a lot of time to use ReLU there. And sigmoid and tan are useful for binary outputs, as I mentioned, and softmax is useful for a categorical output. And Usually there's a preferred loss function that goes with some of the activation functions. Uh, talked about mean squared error with uh, uh, linear regression. Uh, there's one, one called binary cross entropy, which is useful for binary output. And there's also another 
loss function called softmax. It's not quite the same as the activation function, but if you're using softmax activation function, you might want to use the softmax loss function. And I'm not going to go into the details of those, but it's just good to be aware of some of these terms and what they are. There's always more to learn. Okay, so one last thing. Now that we've learned how to evaluate our mini neural network, we've learned how to, to teach it based by backpropagation, updating the weights. Uh, you can do a few more things by fine tuning different things called hyperparameters. And we've already talked about some of these. If you remember our inputs, are also known as features or parameters. So these things are above our parameters or hyperparameters. So some of it already mentioned, there's the learning rate would be considered a hyperparameter. It's something that you can adjust. You can try a higher rate, a lower rate, somewhere in between. And we talked about uh, learning rate decay. You can choose different decay functions. So that'd be another hyperparameter you can adjust. The loss function you choose, you can try different ones. And number of training sessions you choose, you can adjust. Do you want to train it for uh, what we call our training sessions epochs? So you want to train it for 10 epochs or 1,000 epochs. Uh, there's more than this, but there's a lot of tinkering you can do by adjusting hyperparameters to optimize your neural network, your machine learning algorithm. OK. OK. I'm sure there's a nest somewhere. This is, this is getting out of hand. I think I need to call the Daleks. Anyway, so putting it all together, if you're training an AI model, you start with your uh, neural network architecture. You can choose how many hidden layers you want, how many neurons you want in each layer. And once you have that all set up, you start by randomly initializing the weights. So each one will get a different weight. Just start randomly. And then you run it through training. So training epoch one. You input your data that you want to, to process. It'll propagate through all these neurons or nodes. Be, their, each of their activation functions will adjust the, the values, calculate them, send them off to all the other ones. And it'll propagate its way all the way through until it finally gets to the output values, it'll output uh, certain decision is it is it this or that is it what quantity is it what probability is it that it's this what category is it and that's your prediction and then you check how accurate your prediction is by calculating the loss then you use the loss to calculate the uh, how you're going to uh, adjust the weights back back propagate and now you have new values for all your weights in your network and that's first epoch of training. Then you give it more data, do it all over again. And you do it again and again and again, 10 times, 100 times, as many times as you need until you get your loss as low, as close to zero as you want it. And in medicine, we need it as close to zero as possible because people's lives are on the line. And as I mentioned before, if, if you've tried it for a thousand epochs and you're you can't get your loss anywhere near zero, then maybe you need to uh, adjust your hyperparameters, maybe change your neural network architecture. But eventually you'll hopefully find uh, a satisfactory uh, set of weights that'll give you a loss that's close to zero. And at that point, you can say that your model is trained. Now you stop, now you stop changing your weights and you can just put in whatever input you want, and it'll give you its output prediction. And hopefully, it will be perfectly accurate. OK. Now, are there any more questions? OK. So from a previous slide, uh, Rafe asked, is there ever a reason not to use a loss decay function, unless maybe the loss is incredibly small to begin with? 
so you don't need you don't always need a decay function it's the reason for a decay function is basically to save time if you you can you start with a very small learning rate and that'll that'll get you to the minimum that'll get you to your low loss it'll just take multiple steps a lot more steps and if you if your data is fairly simple if your uh, neural network is fairly small and you have a lot of computing power no problem you can use a small neural a small learning rate and don't don't have to worry about decay function it'll get there no problem but if you have a million parameters a 200 layers in your neural network and uh, just a, a laptop to process it then you're going to need a, a learn a, a pretty good learning decay function because you if you use a small value you'll never get there you'll be waiting a million years before it, it's done and if you use it too big you you might just miss it entirely any other questions uh yes how do you decide the architecture of your neural network so that is above my pay grade maybe sarah can answer that one as far as i know it's a lot of trial and error and some some inspiration from biology is taken as well copying existing biological neural networks yeah shane is definitely right with that um there is a lot of trial and error when you're implementing something um there is actually a huge field of research of trying to computationally derive the optimal architecture of a neural network for a task but when you try to deep learn, deep learning, then you just have another deep learning problem where you're not sure what the best parameters are. Um, so that's where the field is at right now. Okay. Any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. Okay. So I wanted to demo this little neural network playground that you guys can play around with. It has some of the features I talked about. So, so up at the top here, we have our, can everybody see this? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So up here we have our play button. This will start training the neural network here. It's a browser neural network. You can play around with it and this will reset it. So let's over here, we can choose our problem type. Let's start with a simple linear regression. And here's our activation functions we can choose. Let's use tan h and you can choose how many hidden layers you want, how many features to choose. So let's use one hidden layer, two neurons. And here we have two features. I think these are supervised features because we're, we're telling it what to look for. In this case, is our value to the left or is it uh, positive or minus in the X direction? And this, is it positive or minus in Y direction? So let's, why don't we start with learning rate that's way too big and so we've got our our data. Our data set is shown here. We've got our blue dots and our orange dots, and we want to figure out if we give it a dot, is it going to be orange or blue? So let's hit play. Over here, you can see our the loss, and our learning rate is so big that it's can't even move, can't even do anything. So let's try stepping it down, and. Uh, start that's too big too how about here okay so now we've got it's working our loss is down to 0 0.012 not bad or if we go smaller oh 0 0.001 even better how about we go real small 
as you can see, it's decreasing, but really slowly. We're at 600 epochs, 700, 800. It'll take forever. So 0.03 was pretty good. There, point, we're at zero in 100 epochs. So there's, there's lots of stuff to play with here. You can try a classification problem. You can try different data sets. And you can try adding different parameters. Try adding more layers, more neurons. Lots of stuff to play with. And over here, there's a, a little bit of stuff about data. I didn't talk too much about data today. That will be in later lectures. but. Usually we use a, a set of training data and divide it up into training and test data. So you can tell it how much of the data you want to use to train it on and how much to test it on. And you can introduce some noise, make it more difficult. Most, data, most real life data sets will have a lot of noise. And you can also choose the batch size. The batch size is for each epoch of training. You don't give it your full data set each time. You give it a, a, a subset or a batch. So you might take, if you have 100 data, 100 data points, you might give it 10 each for each training cycle. So you can play around with that too. All right, I'll send out this link and you guys can play around with it. Hope it'll make a little bit more sense once you take some time to, to play with this. And are there... Any other questions? Okay, so uh, someone asked, is there a software that allows you to build the network yourself? And uh, are there many of these? Many of the softwares? Um, I'm assuming they're asking about yeah, like the software that you're using. Okay, so this is a just the web browser interface that uh, Google provides. And there are some, like to make your own, there's basically use uh, coding. If you sign up for our, our workshops, you'll learn a little bit how to build your own. Uh, <clears throat> but there are different, uh, different machine learning languages that have been have been developed. This one is called TensorFlow. So it's basically a it's a simplified way to to build a neural network. You have to learn a little bit of coding, but you don't need to know like all the details of it. They've figured that out for you, so it makes it a little bit simpler. As far as I, there probably is some graphical program for building a neural network. I. I'm not familiar with any. Sarah, do you know any? Not offhand, no. Okay. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm sure there are out there, but most of it is just writing your own uh, program to, to build it. And join our workshops and you'll learn how to do it. Any other questions? Okay, then I think we'll end it there. I hope it made sense. I hope you learned something. And Sorry, Shane, there's a quick question. Um, someone's asking, how do they join the workshop? Okay. Uh, send an email to uh, ualberta at ames.ca and we'll add you to the list. Okay, I'll end there.